I would like to welcome up Susanna Loeb now, who is the principal investigator of Getting Down to Facts 2, who also served this role with the first Getting Down to Facts in 2007, which uh, laid the groundwork for many of the changes that we see now in our system and, uh, and that this new set of studies is really taking stock of. Susanna Loeb uh, is the director of the Annenberg Institute at Brown University and a professor until very recently was a faculty director of PACE and a professor at Stanford. Uh, please join me in welcoming Susanna up to the stage. Thank you all for coming today. I'm, I'm uh, really excited to be able to talk with you about the results of the study and hopefully that will lead uh, to further discussions about where to go in California. Uh, Getting Down to Facts 2 is essentially a status report on what's going on in California, and it, the aim of it is to serve as kind of a basis of discussion so that we're all on the same page for the, for the difficult trade-offs and discussions that happen as we design new policy and aim to reach some of the goals that we have. So this was a national collaborative research project we have over 100 researchers from across the country involved. They're not all here, <laughs> otherwise they'd be a whole room, but uh, a bunch of them are here today. We produced 36 different research reports, and from those, we kind of pulled them together, 19 briefs, and then we did an overall summary paper. So all of that is available on gettingdowntofacts.com, which, uh, which will be there for you after today, as well as, uh, the discussions that you have today, I think they'll be videoed and available on there as well. One thing that I, I uh, wanted to, to say up front is that what we really try to do, sometimes in our research we, we go for really narrow que questions with really good methods. What we tried to do here was to combine that with sources of, a whole bunch of different sources of information. So we did a public poll to get public, uh, input into what people's goals were and what they saw as issues. We did surveys of teachers and principals. We had interviews with chief business officers and superintendents and policy leaders. And then we tried to look around, not only in California, but also in other states. So, so what you'll get here today is kind of a combination of all of those things. I, uh, Wanted to put up a picture of the researchers because they're really a wonderful group and it's not, it's actually not all of them. I couldn't fit them on so you could actually see anybody's faces and that they would be up there, but it's, it's uh, the lead researchers on the project. And they were so terrific because not only did they produce really wonderful research on their own, but we had really a collaborative process and they contributed a lot to each other's work to get it to where it is today. Um, before I start, I just also wanted to do two quick thank yous. And the first is to Pace and EdSource for putting this on today and really helping the, the research that we've been doing over the last couple of years uh, get into the public discussion. And that's, that's just a terrific gift because we often do research and we don't even know how to reach out. And this has been a great opportunity. And uh, the second is that there are three people. Uh, Sean Bernardo and He Po, from the beginning, really made our meetings happen. They pulled us together. They provided different kinds of opportunity for interaction, which I think you'll see today that's really made the project better. And then uh, I think everybody here knows this, but Jeannie Myung, over the last two years, has really been my <laughs> partner in crime. And she brings so much insight to all of this, so thank, thank you, Jeannie. Um, she, she's just amazing in so many ways. Okay, so what, what did we do and what did we find? So our goal, again, was to provide a base of evidence with an eye towards state policy. So what is it that state policy could do to really help us reach our goals for students? And we broke it into the areas of student success, governance, personnel, and finance. And so you'll see the, the studies focused around those areas. So let's start with the big, big picture. Over the last 10 years, there's been, as many of you know, really substantial changes in California's approaches to education. There's the redoing of the school finance system and the local control finance formula, the um, standards and the new standards and the uh, linked assessments. We have been working towards getting an information system up. And because of that, uh, Cal 
California, now we're, we will provide information or, or um, evidence that that's really pushed California in a good direction. We see positive effects on students and we also see a lot of support for these policies. Nonetheless, California still lags behind in many areas for students and um, there's a lot more to do in order to again provide the kind of uh, education system that we want for students. The way that we've summarized the findings is to really focus us on three areas. So the first is that we have had these uh, really substantial reforms. And so one thing to think about is how we can build on those reforms. And they've set a, a base and infrastructure that, that can allow us to move forward, but we still have a lot of capacity needs if we want to get from them what they have the potential of giving us. We are definitely not there yet, but there's, there is this uh, infrastructure there that really puts us in a better position. So the first is building on reforms. The second is that while we have seen increases in funding since the recession, um, and with local control funding formula, we really spend quite low levels given the high aspirations that we have for students. And we also haven't addressed some key issues like special education finance. There's some issues in facilities finance and then especially pension reform. So there's uh, the level of spending in the state and then these key areas that we haven't addressed. So that's the second one. And then the third one is that though we've made a little bit of progress, our achievement gaps are really substantial. They're substantial on their own and also in comparison to other states and it will take a concerted effort to go at those. So what I'd like to do in about the next 10 minutes is just to go through each of those in a little bit more detail. Okay, so building on current reforms. So we've had these major reforms over the past 10 years, and we essentially need additional supports to um, put them further into practice, to, make, to allow us to realize um, their potential. So again, there are three. Three is such a nice number, but it also just turned out that that's how it, it uh, uh, panned out here. So the first area is funding, like I was talking about, and the local control funding formula. So with the local control funding formula, well, before California saw a big dip in the recession, as, as again you know, and now we have at least caught up to, that, to the pre-recession levels and are even a little bit higher now. And through the local control fun funding formula, we've rationalized how much money goes to each district. So instead of very similar districts getting very different amounts or not addressing differences in need, the new finance formula is much more uh, clear on what the goals are and how much money um, each district is getting. What we've seen is the money that's come in through the local control finance formula has uh, helped student achievement. For example, we as one of the studies estimates that the $1,000 more going to districts, uh, particularly for traditionally underserved populations has increased uh, high school graduation rates by about 5.9% and have, has also benefited us in terms of achievement. So we have kind of those relatively hard numbers and then we just saw broad support for local control funding formula across uh, the state through all of those different ways that we try to gather information. So that's all good. But then if you take a look at the levels of spending um, or you take, well, we'll go to, I'll go to that in a little bit. Um, so even though we've seen those um, positive effects and overall we get very positive results and people are telling us to, to stay the course in terms of the local control funding formula, there are a num the, the funding formula gave districts a lot more control over how to spend the funds and there are a non-trivial number of districts that really need support in figuring out how to allocate their resources to get the results that they need and currently the supports aren't there for those districts to get the kind of uh, professional development and other kinds of support so that they use their money wisely. So while generally good, there we needed um, more supports. The issues with the new academic standards are quite 
similar. So there is broad support, unlike the rest of the country actually. In California, there's really broad support for the Common Core standards, for the Next Generation Science standards, and that, that really pervades. We've also seen some positive results from teachers in terms of reporting that they're getting more and higher quality professional development, and it's more aligned to the standards. And these changes, these improvements, are even bigger in the traditionally underserved classrooms. Um, that said, there is still uh, many teachers that aren't receiving the kinds of supports that they need to put the, the new standards into practice. And this is particularly true for teachers uh, of English language learners. Many superintendents rely or would like to rely on the California Department of Education to help them, uh, not only with uh, providing materials, but with understanding which materials and which supports to choose. There's so many available, and each, each school or each teacher needs to choose the ones that are best for them, and that choice is really hard. So while they would like support from the California Department of Education, the, the department has not uh, invested a lot in uh, content expertise, and the salaries they pay are really low relative to other public uh, jobs in the area, and as a result, there's really not a lot of capacity right now to support schools and teachers and districts in this implementation. Okay, so we've got kind of similar um, similar issues going on in both of those areas. The third is, um, an information system, a data system. When we do what we've done, which is to decentralize and give a lot of control to local areas, there are a lot of people making decisions about uh, how to create the best schools that they can, and they need information for those decisions. And California has made steps forward. When I did this project 10 years ago, you couldn't follow students over time. You can follow students over time and see learning, but still we don't have services linked to that, so we can't understand which ones are doing better than others. And we don't have any uh, or very little information on early childhood, and we can't link it to higher education, so we can't see the long-run effects of things. So we've, again, got this potential in information, but it isn't there as much as we need in order for it to be useful for decision making. There's also an issue that it's very hard to access some of the information. So the combination of it not being comprehensive and the difficulty in getting access to it means that the information system is not as effective as it could be, which is important in a really decentralized state with lots of decision makers. Okay, so that's the first one, which is building on current reforms. We've done a lot of good things, we just need some capacity building. The second one is about increasing funding and fixing the parts of the finance system that we did not address with the local control funding formula. Funding for schools has improved, as I was talking about, and we've seen some benefits of it. Um, but if you look at the level of spending, we spend more than Florida does, about as much as Texas does, but we're lower than Illinois and we are far, far lower than the, the states in the Northeast, where I am now. Um, <laughs> and uh, that might seem like, okay, we're right in the middle, but the problem with that is that California is a place where college graduates earn a lot of money. So that in order to hire college graduates, which what drives the education system, you need to pay higher wages. Because of the high wages in California, which are on par with the East, but they spend so much more on schools, what happens is we have very few adults in the system. Okay, so we have, we are at or near the bottom on numbers of librarians and counselors and teachers and administrators and health workers and all these things are really tied to, to student outcomes. There's that kind of concrete evidence that we are probably not spending enough to reach the goals that we have. On top of that, we also ran what's, what's called an adequacy study from a professional judgment model. So what we did was we had people come in who are experts in the field to design schools serving different populations, and they didn't say we need you know, this many thousands of dollars. They say these are the resources that we need in these different schools, and there were multiple panels doing this separately, and we took that information to get an estimate of the amount of money we would need to spend. Now, this 
isn't perfect. It's very hard to estimate what you need to spend to get someplace where you've never been before. That said, it's, it's as good as we get. It's the best approach that we have for trying to estimate it. And the estimate is that you would need to spend about 38% more than we're currently spending in order to reach that. So really a substantial amount, about a third um, to a little more, more than we're currently spending, which would be at about $16,800 if we, we did that. Now, $16,800, this is in 2016, 17 dollars, but uh, so a little bit more than that. Seems really high for California, but it's actually not as high as, as the states in the east. So it's, it's a, a reasonable but substantial increase from where we are now. Okay, so there's that increase in funds. And now I just want to to, to focus a little more on these areas that we haven't addressed. And I think the most critical, well, maybe not quite the most, the, the two most critical are pensions and special education. Okay, on pensions, what happens is you're supposed to put the money in for teachers as their teachers that will then cover their retirement when they retire. And so you are not, districts are not paying for teachers who have retired, they're paying for their current teachers and their retirement. But we didn't as a state do that. We didn't put enough in for current teachers over years to pay for what it will cost for their retirement in the future. As a result, we are hugely in debt in the, in the uh, pension system. So now we're paying not only for current teachers and their retirement, but also for the retirement of past teachers. And we need to make sure that we not only cover those, but the the, that we're honest about the retirement cost of current teachers, so we're not doing this again in the future. And this isn't a trivial number. By 2021, this is about a third of the cost of current teachers will be going not to current teachers, but to other teachers who have retired. Uh, so in order to, we were just talking about how we needed more money for students. This money is not going to students, this is going to past teachers. So there's a structural issue here that really needs to be addressed. So that's pensions. <laughs> Fun. Should I stop? <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the second is special education. So we, we took a random sample of chief business, business officers across the state and interviewed them. And our first question was really, what are the, what's the big issues? Or what are, what are the three biggest issues facing you? And all 50 said special education finance. So this is something that we haven't addressed uh, in the local control fin finance formula, and especially for small districts, it can be really unpredictable and, um, and, and a huge amount of funds. And so it's not an easy question about what to do, but it does when your budgets are unpredictable and they could be substantially lower from one year to the next, it makes it really hard to have the strategies that you need to kind of do, to do these things like put in new standards and really focus on uh, the students students most at need. So special education finance formula is straining districts and really uh, needs some serious consideration. The last is, is at a smaller scale, but nonetheless, not only critical, but also um, not as hard to fix. And so it's good to have some of those in there. And that's facilities. So we have a facilities funding program in the state, which is kind of, it's a first come, first served. So if you can raise money locally, then you can get more money from the state for your facilities. Well, as a result, it's not, it, it does not equalize. So you, you can see that there's more, there's substantially more facility spending in districts with greater wealth. And that just seems like a, a, an un, productive way of reaching the goals that we have for the state. So I think there are things we can do in facilities funding. The, the level of facilities funding has also dropped, and so there's needs there. But uh, the approach of first come, first served, relying on local capacity is, is, uh, has some, some uh, drawbacks to it. OK, so that's the second area, which is increasing funding and fixing the system. The third area is achievement gaps, and this, this uh, is a really important one, uh, really important results from the study. So we have large achievement gaps in California by race, ethnicity, income, and English learner status, and probably from a range, in a range of other uh, areas as well. We have greater disparities than other states. So if you took the districts that's, that serve the most affluent students, those students are doing about as well as affluent students from across the country. 
You know, they're not doing better than students from across the country, but affluent students here are doing on average what affluent students are doing across the country. But if you look at districts serving non-affluent students, middle income and low income students, we're doing substantially worse. And so that, that shows that our achievement gaps are higher. And it's not that we haven't made progress. California, um, California has seen uh, increases in achievement and actually increases in achievement relative to the rest of the country. But these achievement gaps persist even with that. So part of the inequalities that we see are likely due to our uh, K-12 education policies. One I just talked about was facilities, but uh, we also, you can also see that it's much more difficult for low-income districts to hire and retain teachers with experience, with certifications, uh, administrators as well. And so, so you can see that that creates inequalities likely in the quality of education that those uh, districts are able to provide. Moreover, if you take a look at specific groups, so if you take a look at English language learners, for instance, they have less access to content knowledge, to content knowledge courses. Uh, at least in part because the way that it's structured, their English uh, courses are crowding out some of the content uh, courses. And it may be, too, that they are pushed into the less um, the, the courses with less content. So we have evidence that there are inequalities in the K-12 system and that those inequalities uh, deserve focus uh, for in California. That said, much of the inequality that we see in K-12 schools is ev evident when students enter kindergarten. So the gaps in uh, student achievement across groups at the start of kindergarten um, are they're evident there and they persist. And then that leads you to think, okay, well, what are the early learning opportunities? And I think there's a really terrific set of studies in this overall project that take a look there. And what we see is while other states have systematically invested in early childhood education, both to get a more coherent system and to build quality, we've not, we haven't done that in California. So it is a very difficult system to understand um, if you take a look at it, uh, poor kids are uh, more likely to be in childcare and early education settings that are unlicensed, so they, they don't have any quality um, regulations on them. Non-white students are less likely to, to attend preschool. We've got a lot of um, inequality evident early on, and then we also, we haven't try to put in the kinds of quality uh, controls either by incentivizing quality through something like the QRIS systems, the quality review systems, um, or by uh, creating any kind of information system that would allow us to understand how kids are doing before they enter the system. Okay, so large achievement gaps um, that really deserve focus. That's the, that is the overall findings of the project. So we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years building an infrastructure, but in order to make it useful, we need to invest in capacity. Uh, we are unlikely to be spending enough money to reach the kind of goals that we have, and issues of special ed and pensions are particularly salient, and we need a, a focus on achievement gaps because the achievement gaps in California are greater than the rest of the state, as well as being unacceptable across the nation as a whole, and one area that is likely to need to have focus if we're going to, um, if we're going to make progress there is on early education. So that's a start for trying to understand this. Our hope is today, as you break into sessions, you'll, you'll get a chance to delve into each of these. And if we had to kind of step back and think what our purpose was in all of this, it was really, we hope to put us on the same page in some ways so that we can make some of the difficult decisions that we'll need to make going forward uh, to make uh, California's education system as great as it possibly can be. So on that, I will turn it back to Heather.